Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have a real treat for you all. We have Chris Date with us live in our studio presenting View Updating and How to Make It Work. Chris is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, View Updating and Relational Theory, and he is the author of the best selling O'Reilly books, Database Design and Relational Theory, as well as SQL and Relational Theory. Again, we're really excited to have Chris with us live today, folks, in our studio to present this webcast for you all. As we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Chris. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Chris, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And folks, today our hashtag is StratAConf, all one word. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, please post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Chris for his presentation. Hello, Chris. Thank you, Yasmina. And hi, everybody. Welcome to the webcast. Um, I expect this to be about an hour, hour and a quarter of talking, depending how many questions I get. As Yasmina said, you can ask questions any time. If I can handle the technology here, I will try to answer them um, in real time, as it were. So my topic is uh, view updating, how to make it work. Now, this is a topic that has uh, caused a lot of grief over the years. It's been a contentious issue uh, ever since the relational view concept was first invented, which was back in 1969, 1970. And right up to today, there's a sort of general perception that certain views, at least, simply cannot be updated. Now, I don't believe that. Um, I kind of believe that all views are potentially updatable. And in this presentation, I want to try and convince you that I'm right on that one. So uh, to start with a little preamble, you know, every scientific discipline has its share of unsolved problems. And relational database technology is certainly a scientific discipline. Now, for example, in mathematics, there's the famous Riemann hypothesis, which is still open over something like 150 years. In computer science, probably the biggest unsolved problem is the question of whether P and NP are the same. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. In physics and cosmology, there's the whole search for a grand unified theory, also called a theory of everything. The acronyms are gut and toe. <laughs> I don't know what it is about these uh, cosmologists. They seem to have something weird going on about biology here. Um, they also talk about brains, as you probably know, but, but never mind that. Um, in our line of work, database theory, we have the problem of view updating. Now, I'm not claiming that view updating is in the same league as questions like the Riemann hypothesis, although I have to say that um, I made that claim in my book that I wrote recently on this subject, and one of my critics said, no, 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 it absolutely is in the same league. Well, you can make up your own mind on that one. Now, let's take a look at where we are today. Um, the sad fact is that today, view updating is extremely ad hoc. That is certainly true in the SQL standard. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about the SQL standard in just a moment. It is certainly true in commercial SQL products. And I'm sorry to have to say that to some extent it is even true in the technical literature. And as a consequence of all these shortcomings, 
it is perfectly normal to find that a given SQL system today will prohibit updates on views that are logically updatable, or permit updates on views that are not logically updatable. If we have time, I might elaborate on that point later, we'll see. Or it might implement view updates in a way that is logically incorrect, or most likely in practice, it will do all of the above. So the situation is pretty bad. What is more, if you look at the history, you'll find there's been a huge emphasis on updating restriction views and updating projection views and updating join views, but those are not the only possible kinds of views. What about a union view, for example? You know, we need a solution that works for all possible kinds of views instead of lots of special cases, which is basically what we have today. We need to solve this problem. By the way, um, I kind of take it as a given that everybody knows why we need to solve this problem, but I was very surprised to find the first time I went through this material in a live uh, lecture session, um, some people asked the question, why do we need to solve it? So let me just take a moment to spell it out. The answer is, as it says on this slide here, views are what is needed for logical data independence. In other words, at the bottom of the picture we have the, the physical database. On top of the physical database, we have what SQL calls base tables, base data, okay? That's kind of a logical view of the physical database. And then you have views on top of the base data. And base data gives us the ability to change the physical representation of the database without changing applications. And views give us the ability to change the base data without changing applications. So there are two aspects to data independence. And I'd like to m remark, in a way, um, if you go back to Ted Card's very first two papers on the relational model, his big objective was basically data independence. Anyway, the bottom line from all this is that we must be able to update views. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, this is just a little piece of philosophy, if you like. I don't quite understand why there is so much resistance out in the uh, marketplace to the idea of updating views. Because you see, as it says on this slide, the problem of updating the base data appropriately to support requested updates on views, that problem is exactly the same problem as the problem of updating the stored data appropriately to support requested updates on the base data. Abstractly, it's the same problem. It just shows up at different points in the overall system architecture. And as I've already said, we must solve this problem because otherwise we have to give up on the goal of data independence. Now, everybody agrees that we can do number two here on the slide. I'm telling you that number one is essentially a similar problem. I warned you that I was going to say a little bit, just a little bit, about what the SQL standard has to say on this subject. So this is kind of um, how not to do it. Um, actually, I see you have a question coming. Let's take a look at this. Having a problem with the technology here. Oh, oh here we go. Um, this is uh, why must data independence be accomplished in the data accomplished in the database rather than in a higher business layer? Well, I guess the answer to that is that the database is the common repository. It's supposed to be the base for everything. So you don't you want to solve the problem once, not not in lots of different applications that run on top of the database, no matter how general purpose they might be. So. To go back to um, where I was at, I was about to say something about how the SQL standard does this. I've already indicated that the support for updating views in SQL is limited. It's pretty ad hoc. It's also extremely hard to understand. I've got a quote here from the standard. Quote, the query expression QE1 is updatable if and only if for every query expression or query specification QE2 that is simply contained in QE1, a, QE1 contains QE2 without an intervening query expression body that specifies union distinct, except all, or except distinct. B, if QE1 simply contains a query expression body QEB that specifies union all, and on, and I hope you're taking notes here. There's going to be a little quiz later on. It, this goes on for quite a bit of text in the um, standard, and it finishes up in, if all these conditions are true, then you can update that expression. Now, right away, you can see this is nonsense because it's not a question of expressions being updatable. 
which has an update views, but never mind. Notice that what I've just been through is just one of many, many, many rules that all have to be taken together in order to figure out whether a given SQL view is updatable. Those rules are scattered all over the standard of different places. As you can see from the example I gave you, the rules apply, uh, rely on all kinds of additional things, additional concepts, additional constructs like updatable columns, leaf generally underlying tables, and on and on and on. These are defined in still further parts of the document. And what is more, the picture is complicated even further. further. Um, according to the standard, a view can be updatable, it can be potentially updatable, it can be simply updatable, or it can be insertable into. Now, I don't have a clue what these different terms mean, um, except to tell you that updatable covers delete and update, but not insert. And notice the fourth bullet there says insertable into. That kind of suggests that you can have views that you can insert into, but can't delete from. Well, in that case, can't you also have views that you can delete from, but not insert into? I mean, there's some sort of weird asymmetry going on here. I have another question come up here. I see a follow-up question to the last one. How often is a database used for more than one application? Well, <clears throat> I can't answer that. I uh, don't get my hands dirty in the, out of the trenches anymore. But the general idea is certainly that a database is supposed to be suitable for any number of possible applications, including ones that were not even foreseen at the time the database was created. Uh, that's a whole big topic in its own right, which I don't have time to talk about today, I'm afraid. Anyway, back to the SQL standard. Um, simplifying somewhat, we can say loosely that according to the standard, these views are updatable. Uh, a restriction of one base table, or a projection of one base table, or a combination of the two. For joins, it can be a one-to-one -one join or a one-to-many join. In the case of the one-to-many join, you can update the many side, but not the one side. For union, you can update a union or, but not a union distinct. You can update an intersection, and, and there are various combinations of those first three cases. But even these cases are not done properly because of all kinds of problems of SQL. <laughs> the first, as you probably would guess, is nulls. They always mess things up. Second is duplicates. Third is inadequate support for constraints, and there are other things, too. So looking at this mess, the obvious question is, surely we can do better than that, surely. So I want to try and present a way that um, looks like it should be able to move us forward. I'm going to base my examples and the rest of the presentation on the famous suppliers and parts database. Now, I'm perfectly sure you didn't expect to see a presentation from me without seeing the suppliers and parts database. And I apologize for the fact that this is such a tired example. But the truth is, the example has been very carefully tailored to illustrate all kinds of points, and it's suitable for us today. So very quickly, in the suppliers and parts database, we have a suppliers table, S, we have a parts table, P, and we have a shipments table, SP, showing which suppliers supply which parts. Actually, that's the standard running example, but I think in my presentation today, I'm not going to be bothered with table P. I'll just look at S and SP. Now, I do have to explain a little bit of groundwork before I can get into the real substance of the presentation. So I have to take a few pages on what I'm assuming you already know. First is, I assume you know that there's a logical difference between relation values and relation variables. If we back up just a moment to the previous page, we all understand that what we're looking at here is the value of the database at a particular time. And if we looked at a different time, after some updates have been done, we would see different things here, different values. So these three things that I call tables, um, what they really are is variables, because their value changes over time. As a matter of fact, oh, sorry, got the wrong way, I knew I'd do that. As a matter of fact, those three tables, as I call them before, really represent relation variables, and their value at a given time is relation values. So that database contains three relation variables whose value at any given time is three relation values. Let me skip to the next page for a moment and illustrate this point. 
At the top of the page, I have a simplified version of the supplier's relation variable. It happens to have three supplier tuples, as I will call them here. So the current relation value has tuples for three suppliers. Now suppose we um, do an update. Suppose we say delete S where city equals Paris from S. But we all know what that's going to do. But let me now point out that that delete is really a kind of shorthand for a certain assignment operation, a relational assignment operation. In that assignment, on the left-hand side, we have a reference to a variable S, because you always have a reference to a variable on the left-hand side in an assignment. On the right-hand side, we have an expression, a relational expression, S where city not equals Paris. And we evaluate that expression. It says, take the current value of S with its three tuples, pick out the ones where the city is not Paris. That actually reduces it just down to one tuple. The result of that expression is a relation containing one tuple, a relation value with one tuple. We assign it to the relation variable. And so at the bottom of the picture here, we see the value of the relation variable after the delete has been done, or after the assignment has been done. So of course, it's still the same variable, but the value is now different. So delete, you see, is really shorthand. Well, I say shorthand, actually, it's longer than the thing it's supposed to be short for. But anyway, it's basically a different syntax for writing a certain assignment. And we'll see in a moment that the same is true for insert and the same is true for update. But, uh, let me go back to the previous page again. There we go. Um, so insert, delete, and update are really shorthand for certain relational assignments. The next thing I assume you know is that rel vars, which is the term I use as a shorthand for relation variables, relation variables or rel vars are subject to constraints. These are things that constrain the legal values that can be assigned to the variables. Um, we all know about the key constraints. For example, in the case of suppliers, there's a key constraint that says every supplier has a unique supplier number. And we know about foreign con key constraints. In my example, the fact that supplier number in the shipment's relevar has to match supplier numbers in the supplier's relevar, that's a foreign key constraint. And we're used to that, I know. So basically, insert, delete, and update are shorthand for a relational assignment. Relational assignment is actually the only update operator we need, logically speaking. Insert, update, delete are just sort of user conveniences. But it's very easy to prove, too, that any arbitrary relational assignment to some railway call it R is logically equivalent to one of this form. R is assigned little r minus little d union little i, where little r is the old value of the railway and little d is a set of tuples to be deleted from the old value, and little i is a set of tuples to be inserted. <clears throat> In fact, there's a picture at the bottom. Um, the outer ellipse here, I've labeled it u, is kind of the universe of all possible tuples of some particular kind. Then we have in there some subset of the universe, which represents the current value little r of the rel var. And within that, some subset, little d, which is the tuples we're going to delete. And then i is a set of tuples out in the universe that we're going to insert. So looking over to the left of the slide, we have little d as a subset of little r. Everything we're going to delete is a tuple that's already there. Little r and little i are disjoint. We're not going to try and insert any tuples that are already there. Little d and little i are unique, and they're disjoint. They have no common tuples. And as I said, U is kind of the universe, the universal relation of the right type. So we can see that the assignment that we just looked at on the previous page is equivalent to doing a certain delete from R and a certain insert into R. But that delete and insert are both part of one operation. It's what we call a multiple assignment. The two pieces here, the delete and insert, are all part of a single operation. So every assignment is equivalent to a certain delete, a combination of a certain delete and a certain insert. Given that that is true, going to the bottom of the slide now, I propose that every assignment, every update, if you like, to some given rel var r, doesn't matter how it's expressed syntactically, 
we always map it conceptually to a delete plus an insert, where the delete set, the tuples to be deleted, call that D, and insert, the tuples to be inserted, call that I. D and I are well-defined, disjoint, and unique. And it's going to follow, therefore, that because every assignment can be mapped to basically a combination of a delete set and insert set, um, there isn't an awful lot to say about explicit update operations. If I have nothing to say in this pr a presentation, it means that update can be treated straightforwardly as just a delete and an insert. Now, I want to repeat, this mechanism I'm going to be describing is driven by semantics. It's not driven by syntax. So every relational assignment can be mapped to a delete and an insert, where the delete set and the insert set are well-defined, disjoint, and unique. But it's important to understand that two relational assignment can, assignments can have different syntax and yet correspond to the very same delete set and same insert set. I have a trivial example here. We have a rel var r with two attributes, k and a. k is the key. And let's suppose um, that r currently contains just two tuples. Um, I've shown them in parentheses here, 1, 2, and 3, negative 2 using a very simple, obvious notation for tuples. Now, consider these two updates on the same slide. Update R make K equal to K plus A, or update R make A equal to negative A. And if you think about it, I'm not going to go through the details now, if you think about it, that there's the example repeated at the top of this next slide. Both of those updates correspond to a delete set containing the two tuples, 1, 2, and 3, negative 2, and an insert set containing 1, negative 2, and 3, 2. Both updates have the same effect on the row bar. In fact, both of them are logically equivalent to just assigning a relation to the row bar containing the two tuples, k value 1, a value negative 2, and k value 3, a value negative 2. So there's an example of two very different syntactic updates that are actually logically equivalent. And I say again, I'm not really interested in syntactic differences. I want the rules I'm going to be presenting to be driven by D and I, and not by the syntax. Still on stuff that I hope you already know, there's a couple of very important principles. And the first one is so important, we call it the golden rule. It's very simple. It simply says that you can never violate any constraints. No database is ever allowed to violate any constraint, and therefore, in particular, no railvar is ever allowed to violate any constraint. But notice uh, a view, which we're going to be talking about in a while, a view is a relation variable. It's a virtual relation variable. So we, it's going to follow that no view is ever allowed to violate any constraint. We'll come back to that. The other general principle is the assignment principle. And this is also extremely trivial. It simply says that after assigning the value little v to the variable big V, the comparison little v equals big V must give true. That's kind of obvious. In fact, it's more or less the definition of assignment, isn't it? So it is true of variables in general. It's a true of relation variables in particular. And as a matter of fact, it's true of the whole database, because actually the whole database is really a giant variable. And just as an aside, I would remark that this obvious rule is violated all over the place in SQL. So I'm not really here to talk about SQL today. Still some stuff I hope you know. Uh, every relation variable has a certain predicate. And predicate is just a fancy word to stand for what the relevant means to the user. It's the user understood meaning. In the case of suppliers, it's this sentence in green. Uh, the supplier with a specified supplier number is under contract, let's say, is named the specified S name, has status the specified status value, and is located in the specified city. That's what the user understands the railbar to mean. Every railbar has a predicate. And very important, we adopt something called the closed world assumption. Now, we always follow this in practice with databases. We don't usually bother to spell it out, but we do follow it. And what it says is, at any given time, a given railbar contains all and only those tuples that make the predicate true at that time. So 
thinking about suppliers, and I don't know if you recall, but there was a tuple in my sample database for, for supplier one. It said supplier one is Smith 20 London. It is therefore assumed to be true right now that supplier S1 is under contract, is named Smith, has status 20, and is located in London. So each of the tuples corresponds to something that's supposed to be true. And what is more, we go further. If a given tuple could appear but does not, we assume it doesn't satisfy the predicate. For example, again, if you go back to my sample values, you'll see there is not a tuple in RELVAR S at the moment saying supplier 6, Lopez 30, Madrid. So we are entitled to assume that right now it is not the case that there is a supplier S6 called Lopez, status 30, City Madrid. In other words, at any given time, the RELVAR contains exactly the tuples that make the predicate true at that time. Oh, yes, I just have to get this silly little thing out of the way. Um, I don't know why it is, but our field is so bad about terminology. If you look at a lot of the current literature and databases, you'll find a lot of talk about something called materialized views. Now, the, con the, the term materialized view is a contradiction in terms, really because the whole point about views, is, as far as the relational model is concerned, is they're not materialized, they're virtual. Well, that's bad enough. What happens next is that the literature then typically goes on to abbreviate the term materialized view to just view. So much so, in fact, that almost ubiquitously the unqualified term view in the literature now come, has now come to mean a materialized view. And we don't have a good term for view in its original sense. Well, let me warn you that in this presentation, I do use the unqualified term view in its original sense. I do not use it to mean a materialized view. In fact, I don't use the latter term at all in general, and I'd like to suggest that you shouldn't either. There is a perfectly good term. There always was a perfectly good term for the thing that people call materialized views. The term was snapshot. And that, if you want to talk about that thing, please use that term. So I'm talking about views. All right, well, that's been a very long preamble, and I apologize for the length of it, but now let's get down to something of technical substance. But my motivating example, I'm going to focus on suppliers, the supplier's base RELVAR. And at the top, I show a definition of that RELVAR. I don't show it in SQL because SQL introduces too many red herrings into this topic. Um, it's actually in a language that I call Tutorial D. Never mind that. The point is, it's self-explanatory. We have a variable, that's what var says, it's called s, that's the name. It's a base row var. It has a certain relation type, which consists of the keyword relation and an attribute supplier number of type character string and supplier name of type character string, status of type integer, city of type character string, and finally supplier number is key. So that's the base row var suppliers. Now let's define a couple of views. I'll define a view London suppliers. Variable LS, London suppliers, virtual. That means it's a view. And it's defined to be suppliers where city equals London. And by the way, supplier number is still the key for that view. And I'll define another one, non-London suppliers. Uh, NLS, S where city is not equal to London. Again, supplier number is the key for that view. On this page, I've shown sample values. At the top is the current value of the supplier's base rover. And then we have the current value for LS and the current value for NLS. <coughs> As I've, I've used blue for London suppliers and green for non-London suppliers. Now, here comes the crucial observation. Instead of suppliers being a base rover or a real rover, if you like, and London suppliers and non-London suppliers being views, we could go the other way. Let's back up a moment. Look at this picture again. I could define LS and NLS as two base row bars, and then I could define their union as a view called S. It comes to exactly the same thing. So there are at least two different ways to design the database in this particular case. So on this page, I've simply shown what would happen syntactically if I did that. I've made LS a base row bar, NLS a base row bar, and S is a virtual rail view defined as LS union NLS. 
Matter of fact, it's a disjoint union because there's no tuffle that appears in both London suppliers and non-London suppliers. So the two designs are uh, information equivalent. They both carry the same information. You can do the same queries on both. So formally speaking, when you do design, which rel vars you choose to, be, to make base ones and which ones you choose to make views is somewhat arbitrary. In the example, you could go at least two different ways. And that consideration leads to a very important principle, the principle of interchangeability. It's spelled out on the slide. There must be no arbitrary and unnecessary distinctions between base and virtual rel bars. Because which ones are base and which ones are virtual, that is arbitrary in itself. Or to put it more colloquially, virtual rel bars should look and feel just like base rel bars as far as the user is concerned. For example, the question of having a key or not. If rel bars have keys in general, then virtual rel bars have keys in particular. You should be able to declare a key for a virtual rel bar. In fact, I did in my example. SQL doesn't allow that, but it should. Or integrity in general. We have a general notion that integrity constraints apply to base rel bars, but no, integrity constraints apply to all rel bars. Um, there's something called entity integrity, which um, actually is highly suspect for several reasons. But if you follow the entity integrity rule, it must apply to base rel bars as well as views, and so on. And the last point of the slide, we must be able to update views. That is a hard requirement, because the updatability of your data does not depend on the arbitrary choice as to which rel vars you make base ones and which ones you make virtual ones. So let me elaborate for a moment on this question of information equivalence. Um, I'm going to get slightly formal on you for a moment. Um, oh, back up for a second. There's a question here. Um, in my example, a while back, I used union. Is there any reason it couldn't use X union? Um, <laughs> X union is an exclusive union. Um, I think what you really mean here is disjoint union. X union is, is the same as symmetric difference. Um, so, um, let's see. You could certainly define views of X union, of course, but uh, it would be a different example. I guess I'll, I'll just let it lie there for the moment. I'm trying to teach, uh, take a simplest possible example to build on. So what I was about to say was I want to elaborate on the notion of information equivalence. Um, and I'm going to get slightly formal on you just for a moment. Let DB1 and DB2 be two different sets of rel vars. Of course, I'm kind of suggesting by the name that these are two databases, but never mind that. And suppose there are mappings, M12 and M21, that transform any given value little db1 of db1 into a value little db2 of db2, and the other way around. If those mappings exist, and by mappings here I mean basically um, sets of operations of the relational algebra, if those mappings exist, then db1 and db2 are information equivalent, and therefore so are their current values, little, D1, little db1 and little db2, a fortiori. What that means is, for every query you can do on little db1, there's a query you can do on little db2 that will give exactly the same result, and vice versa, of course. Moreover, if db1 and db2 are information equivalent, and their values, current values, are little db1 and little db2, then basically, for any update you can do on db1, there's an update you can do on db2. Let u1 be an update on db1, that given the little db1 is the current value, gives db1 prime, then there must exist an update u2 on db2, that given little db2, yields db2 prime, such that db1 prime and db2 prime are information equivalent. And this is illustrated on the next page. In pictures, at the top we have the current value of little db1 and the little value of little db2, their information equivalent. There's an update u1 that will turn little db1 into little db1 prime. There's an update u2 that will turn little db2 into little db2 prime, such that the two primed values are also information equivalent. 
Now that's some just common sense generalities that spelled out in a slightly formal way, but notice now the red sentence at the bottom of the slide, in particular, everything I've said is true if db1 is base rel vars only and db2 is views only, views of the rel vars in db1. So you can have a, a database and then a bunch of views on the database and a bunch of views can be information equivalent to the original database. Well, turning this around, suppose db1 and db2 are not information equivalent and their current values little db1, little db2. Well, in general, then, there will be queries and updates on little db1 that have no counterpart on db2 or, or the other way around. And the relevance of that point will become clear in a little while. So let's take a closer look at our example, London versus non-London suppliers. Because of the principle of interchangeability, the behavior of the Relvar's London suppliers and non-London suppliers, when well, it comes to that, the behavior of S itself, that behavior must not depend on which of these Relvar's are base ones and which ones are views. So to keep it simple, for the time being, let's suppose they're all base Relvar's. So we have S as a base Relvar, LS as a base Relvar, NLS as a base Relvar. Now, these three Relvar's coexist in the database. They live alongside each other. Well, clearly there are some constraints that interrelate these relvars. For example, there's a constraint that says LS is equal to S or city equals London. And there's a constraint that says NLS is equal to S or the city is not London. And come to that, there's a constraint that says if you go to NLS and pick up the tuples of the city is London, the result will be empty. There aren't any London tuples in NLS. Likewise, there aren't any non-London tuples in LS. And there's more. Um, there's a constraint that says that S is equal to the union of LS and NLS. Every tuple that appears in S also appears in either LS or NLS. Which, of course, as you, I'm sure you already realize, means this database has a lot of redundancy. Basically, everything in there we say twice. I'll come back to that point too in a little while. Um, also, we know that LS and NLS are disjoint. No, no tuple appears in both of them. As a matter of fact, we can be sort of tighter than that. No supplier number appears in both LS and NLS. If you take LS and project on supplier number, and NLS and project on supplier number, those two projections are disjoint. So we have all these redundancies, all these constraints that tie these two relvars, these, sorry, three relvars together. So what does that mean for updates? Let's think about delete first, because in a way delete is the easy case. Clearly what we're going to need is certain compensatory actions to keep the relvars in sync in the, in the face of updates. Um, the compensatory actions in this particular case are actually cascade delete rules. Let me immediately jump to the next page for a moment. Um, I know you're familiar with this concept. You may not know the term. But a compensatory action is an update performed automatically by the system in addition to some requested update, and the purpose is to avoid some integrity violation that might otherwise occur. And cascading a delete operation is a typical example. Forget about views and so on for a moment. Think of suppliers and shipments. We might have a cascade delete rule that says if you delete supplier one from the supplier's rollbar, you must also delete the shipments for supplier one from the shipments from R. You cascade the delete from suppliers to shipments. That particular example has to do with foreign keys. But actually, I'm going to tell you, maybe you never thought of this before, but the cascade delete idea applies to constraints in general, not just to foreign key constraints. What is more, um, Compensatory actions should be specified declaratively because in the relational world, we want to do everything declaratively if we can. And what's more, users should know about them. Now, think of suppliers and shipments again for a moment. If the user deletes a tuple for supplier one from suppliers, and lo and behold, certain tuples get deleted from the shipments rather as well, 
the user needs to understand that's going to happen. The user needs to know about the compensatory action because otherwise they might see changes that they didn't ask for in the database, which means they would see a violation of the assignment principle. The general point is if there are compensatory actions around that affect data the user sees, then the user needs to know about them. Now let me back up again a moment. <clears throat> So we need some compensatory actions for deletes, and as a matter of fact, exactly what we need is some cascade delete rules. And here they are. On delete D from S, delete D where city equals London from LS, and delete D where city not equals London from NLS. NLS. <clears throat> and that's common sense. What it says is if you delete a tuple from suppliers, well, that same tuple appears in either LS or NLS, so you delete it from whichever one it's in. Turning that around, if you delete a tuple from LS, that's a London supplier tuple, you clearly need to delete the same tuple from S. And likewise, if you delete a tuple from NLS, you need to delete that from S as well. Um, I have a question here. Does your book cover more advanced examples, for example, aggregations? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, I'll say a word about that at the end of the webcast here. But <clears throat> for obvious reasons, I'm taking the simplest possible example to illustrate the, um, the approach. Uh, in a way, the example is so simple, everything is sort of blindingly obvious. But the concepts it illustrates are going to be applicable to all kinds of views. So we have the cascade delete rules. Um, incidentally, this is just an aside, but it relates to what I was saying earlier about redundancy. If these three rail bars are indeed all base rail bars, which is what I'm assuming at the moment, then those compensatory actions are exactly what's needed to control the redundancy. They're, need, there's, they're needed to carry out what's called update propagation. Um, just a word on redundancy. When we do database design, we have a vague idea that we want to avoid redundancy. In a way, that's true. But a more accurate way to say it is if there is redundancy, the redundancy needs to be controlled. It needs to be managed by the system so it never hurts the user. Compensatory actions are the way to do that. I have another question here. How would you handle updates over a view which is defined as a join of two different tables? Well, let me stack the question. I, I, I want to explain the basic ideas first. At the end, I'm going to say something about other operators. So there are the... Uh, Delete, upper, delete rules, if you like. Um, and as I've said already, these rules have to be visible to the user, assuming the user sees all three rail bars, precisely because of the assignment principle. By the way, don't get hung up on the syntax. The syntax I'm using is just to illustrate the ideas. Um, I'll skip that point. Um, oh, yes, here's another sort of red herring I have to get out of the way. I've said that compensatory actions should be specified declaratively. So I'm not talking about triggers, which are typically procedural. A trigger, of course, is a ch chunk of procedural code that fires up automatically when a certain update is done. Let me just say a word about triggers for a moment. First point is that the system cannot determine the triggers that are needed for itself. <laughs> In fact, if it could, you wouldn't have to have triggers. By contrast, the compensatory actions I'm talking about, I am... I believe that the system can determine those for itself. So that's a big difference right there. Secondly, the way we work today, triggers are typically hidden from the user, whereas my compensatory actions have to be visible to the user. In fact, triggers very typically do violate the assignment principle, especially if they're so-called instead of triggers. Triggers also typically violate the set level nature of the relational model. That is certainly true in the standard, which explicitly supports something called row level triggers. That is not relational. If you do that kind of thing, you are, you're in a state of sin. You're not doing relational stuff anymore. And triggers in general are not logically required, whereas my compensatory, action, compensatory actions are logically required. On the other hand, given that today's systems don't support compensatory actions very much, you could perhaps use triggers to implement the ideas I'm talking about, although I think it would be kind of tough to do, especially if the system doesn't allow you to have recursion in triggers, but that's a whole other topic in itself. 
just uh, back to my example, we've seen the uh, delete rules. We need some insert rules as well. And as a matter of fact, these are going to be cascade insert rules too. On insert I into S, insert I where city equals London into LS, and insert I where city not equals London into NLS. And turning it around, on insert I into LS, you insert a tuffle into London suppliers, you must also insert that tuffle into suppliers, and the same for non-London suppliers. So here we have some cascade insert rules. Now this might be a novel idea. We don't have anything like this in connection with foreign keys, do we? But in general, we are going to need insert rules as well as delete rules. And, uh, well, I guess I've already said this. In these delete and insert rules, little d and little i are really parameters, and they are the values of the delete set and the insert, respectively, as we have computed them after the update operation has been mapped to an assignment of the form delete plus insert. I say again, I don't want to be driven by syntax. So let's look at a couple of examples of explicit updates. Um, oh, I have another question come in. So, so are there no common ways to implement compensatory actions? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question means. I mean, you understand we're talking a little bit about the realm of research here because the systems today don't even support much in the way of view updating. So figuring out a, an efficient way to implement compensatory actions uh, is an interesting implementation question. By the way, I'm not an implementer, so I, I guess I shouldn't pontificate on that one too much. Um, I will tell you that um, a colleague of mine is certainly doing some research in this direction right now. Let me leave it at that. So I wanted to look at some examples of explicit updates. The first one says, update non-London suppliers. Now, remember, we're still all base rail bars, no views yet. Update non-London suppliers with a supply number supplier to make the city Oslo. So conceptually what happens is we delete the old tuple for supplier to from NLS. The cascade delete rule kicks in and we delete the same tuple from S. Then we insert the new tuple of S2 with its city now Oslo into NLS and the cascade insert rule kicks in and the new tuple gets inserted into S. And that works just fine. Everything's happened fine. Second example, suppose you direct an update to S. Update S with a supply number just to make the city of London. Now, I don't suppose you remember, but actually the city for supplier to in my example was Paris. So it's in NLS. So we delete the old tuple for S2 from S, and therefore it cascades and deletes from NLS. We insert the new tuple for S2 with its city London into S, and the cascade insert rule kicks in, and the new tuple gets inserted into London suppliers. So very loosely what has happened here is that the tuple for supplier two has migrated from non-London suppliers to London suppliers. And that is the logically correct thing to do. Third and last example, suppose we direct an update at NLS, update NLS where the supply number is S2, make the city London. Well. We delete the old tuple for S2 from NLS and therefore delete it from S. And then we try to insert the new tuple for S2 into NLS, but that insert fails because there's an integrity constraint on NLS that says the city must not be London. So the update fails. It's a golden rule violation, and everything is undone, and the data space is left in the state it was in before. So basically the update is rejected. So, still base rail bars. Consider a user now who sees only London suppliers and non-London suppliers. Doesn't see the suppliers rail bar at all. That user thinks of those two rail bars as base rail bars, which indeed they are in our example. The user knows the corresponding predicates, but the user knows what these two rail bars mean. The user knows certain constraints. The user knows that um, in NLS the city um, must, be, must not be London. In LS, it must be London. It knows that those two rail bars are disjoint with respect to supply numbers. Notice that these constraints refer only to London suppliers and non-London suppliers. They don't refer to rail bar S. This user doesn't even know that rail bar S exists. Also, the user does not know about any, about any compensatory actions, because all the compensatory actions refer to S, 
and this user doesn't know about S. And if you think about it, I think you can easily see that all of these, all of the updates will work exactly as you would expect. Um, I've got a couple more questions here. Are there any current or in-progress implementations of these ideas so that these ideas can be tested in actual databases? I think the short answer is not as far as I know. Sorry about that, but I'm actively pushing for that. And another question, why are the where clauses needed in the LS and NLS ROLVARs? Um, no, the where clauses were not in the ROLVAR definitions. Remember, at the moment, they're all base ROLVARs. I just said there are, if you, there are three tables, if you like, but there are constraints. There's a constraint that LS is equal to S where city equals London. So the where clause shows up in the constraint. And just to finish up my example, still all base rollbars. Now imagine you have a user who sees only non-London suppliers. Now the user knows the predicate for that one and knows the key constraint and also knows the constraint that um, there are no tuples in this rollbar with City London. Now there's obviously going to be certain operations this user can't do. For example, the user can't do an insert on this rollbar because there's a chance that such an insert will violate a constraint that this user doesn't know about and cannot know about. For example, if you try to insert a tuple for, um, let's say, supplier one into NLS, that has to fail because there already is a supplier one, but the user doesn't know that. But the point is, you see, there's no magic. This user is not seeing the whole picture. In fact, what this user sees is not information equivalent to the whole picture. So it's perfectly reasonable that there are going to be certain things that users are not allowed to do. Now, I, think this, you know, I think it is quite reasonable for the database administrator to say to a particular user, okay, here is the piece of the database you can work with, but you're not seeing the whole picture, and precisely because of that, there are going to be certain things you can't do. Specifically, you can't do A, B, C. I think I'll skip that page. So putting it all together, here again are the um, RELVAR definitions and all the constraints and the compensatory actions. And now, <laughs> at last, you might be thinking, at last we come to the point. The point is that everything I have said applies more or less unchanged if some of the RELVARs or all of the RELVARs happen to be views, thanks to the principle of interchangeability. So taking the case that we're probably most interested in here, Suppose S, suppliers, is a base rollbar, <coughs> and LS and NLS are views. Well, there are compensatory actions. On delete D from S, you delete certain tuples from LS, and you delete certain tuples from NLS. On insert I into S, you insert certain tuples into LS, and so on. Uh, these actions, in fact, are implicit, and they happen automatically. And if if London Supplies is a view of S, and you delete a tuple from S where the city of London, that tuple will be deleted from LS. So these actions happen automatically. They are implicit. But if the user sees all three relvars, the user must be aware of these rules, because these are what guarantee no violation of the assignment principle. And going the other way, um, the compensatory actions from London suppliers and non-London suppliers back to suppliers in general, these are the view updating rules. If you do a delete on LS, you delete the corresponding tuples from S. If you do an insert into LS, you insert the corresponding tuples into S, and very similarly for NLS. And these operations, these actions happen automatically too, given the obvious straightforward implementation. But again, I say, if the user sees all three rel bars, the user must know about these rules, because otherwise, he or she will see a violation of the <coughs> assignment principle. And now imagine a user who sees only the views and doesn't know about the base rel bar S. This is very similar to something we saw a few minutes ago. This user thinks of these two rel bars as base ones. The user knows the plan number is the key. The user knows the predicates. The user knows the constraints. The user does not know about any, about any compensatory actions because they all apply, they all mention S and the user doesn't know about S, and everything works exactly as expected. Note in particular, 
that if the user tries to do an update on non-London suppliers, making the city London, uh, that update must fail on a violation of the golden rule. It does not cause the tuple to migrate from non-London suppliers to London suppliers. Now, this is a difference. This is something that today's products get logically wrong. In traditional approaches to view updating, that migration probably would occur because today's products are very, very bad at handling integrity constraints. As for a user who sees just one of the views, let's say non-London suppliers, that user thinks of it as a base rail bar, knows the predicate, knows the key constraint, knows another constraint, but again, there'll be certain things this user cannot do because we don't have information equivalents. Again, I say there's no magic. So this is kind of the, uh, the most important slide in the whole presentation. What I'm suggesting here is this. Um, I will agree that the motivating example is extremely trivial, and the conclusions I draw from it are all pretty obvious, except the footnote there. I've already pointed out that there's at least one thing that is different from the way today's systems behave. But what I'm saying is this. The view-defining expressions imply certain constraints. So I am hoping that the system will be able to infer the constraints that apply knowing the view-defining expressions. And then the constraints in turn imply compensatory actions. And I'm hoping again that the system can figure out for itself from the compensatory actions what the uh, sorry, from the constraints what the compensatory actions should be. In other words, as it says at the bottom of the slide, I am not suggesting that the database administrator should have to specify, spell out explicitly all of the constraints and all of the compensatory actions that apply in any given situation. The poor old DBA has enough to do as it is. But it is my belief that most of this, if not all of it, can be automatic. You simply define the base row bars, define the views, which means, of course, you define the view-defining expression, the view-defining expression implies the constraints, and the constraints imply the compensatory actions. Now, I'm getting near to the end of an hour here. Um, just a few more things I want to say. Um, I've considered the case where London suppliers and non-London suppliers are views of the base rail bar, um, and I'm, particularly I've considered the case of the user sees, let's say, London suppliers are not suppliers in general. To do the thing completely, I'll to turn it around and consider what happens if London suppliers and non-London suppliers are base rail bars and S is a view. But then what happens is that S is a union view. And of course, it turns out that union views and what I've been talking about, which are restriction views, are really two sides of the same coin. I'm not going to do that in the presentation. It is certainly covered in the book, of course. Now, I do have another example in here. Um, I think perhaps it isn't worth going through this in detail. Um, I, what the example does is it again talks about two restrictions with the difference that the two restrictions are not disjoint anymore. One is non-London suppliers, one is non-Paris suppliers. And so suppliers who are not in London and not in Paris appear in both of the views. I think I'll simply say that there are no real surprises. All, all of the, um, comp the constraints are what you would expect all of the compensatory actions are what you would expect. Everything works perfectly. So let me just skip a couple of slides here. All right, I'm getting to very close to the end. I, I wanted to contain this within about an hour. Here is the message. It's true that if there is no compensatory action in some particular situation, then certain updates will fail. They'll fail on violations of the golden rule. So it is still true that some updates will fail on some views, but it's not because certain views are inherently non-updatable. After all, think of base robots. Certain updates fail on certain base robots too because they violate integrity constraints. Certain updates fail on certain views, not because the views are intrinsically non-updatable, but because 
the update violates certain integrity constraints. So bottom line here, I believe all views are updatable modulo integrity constraint violations. <clears throat> and I also think that um, this way of thinking about the problem, thinking about the views of living alongside the base railways in terms of which they're defined, think of them being connected to those base railways through constraints and hence through compensatory actions. This is the right way to think about the view updating problem. Now, I say again, the example I used in this presentation was extremely simple and based on restriction. And of course, in many ways, restriction is the easiest possible case. But as it says on this slide, um, the research has been done. And the book describes views that are based on restrictions, views that are based on projections. Yes, views that are based on joins. And by the way, the joins can be one to one or one to many or many to many. It doesn't make any difference the view updating rules work. It talks about intersection, union, and different views. It talks about grouping and ungrouping views. It talks about extension and view, summarization views. This relates to a question the gentleman asked earlier um, about updating through something like an average. Summarization is where you apply one of these aggregate operators like um, sum or average. Yes, we can talk about updating through those. Um, the book also talks about updating through general expressions, so expressions of arbitrary complexity. And then the final chapter talks about situations where there may be some ambiguities and what we can do about resolving those ambiguities. And let me just say a couple of final things. I don't pretend that we have solved every last detail of the view updating problem. And there are certainly places in the book where people could argue about a couple of things. And I've tried to be honest about it where I think there could be some debate, I have uh, flagged the, the point appropriately in the book. So um, I'm perfectly open and willing to listen to constructive suggestions of how to uh, resolve such situations. But what I've tried to do in the book is move the whole debate about view updating a big step further on from where it used to be. So <clears throat> that brings me to the end. That's all she wrote. Um, if there are more questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Um, I think I have to click this little thing here. Yeah. And folks, as you, if, excuse me, Chris, as you've heard, we are at Q&A, so we'd like to let you know if you haven't opened that group chat yet, please do open it, type in your question, send it in, and Chris will answer as many questions as we have time for. Back to you, Chris. Okay. I see I have a bunch of questions here. Um, what is your favorite database among available at present? Which <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> my lawyer tells me never to answer that question. Um, no, I, I clearly cannot answer that one because it's going to cause all kinds of problems. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize, but I will not answer that. Um, I, I will say, um, no, I probably shouldn't say that either. No, no, my lips are sealed. Um, what about views of computed values? Can you update a computed value? What would happen to the base values? Uh, the short answer is yes, you can update such views. You can update computed values within limits. It, it all comes down to um, the, the basic point is, imagine you have the base rail vars living alongside the views. Is there an inverse mapping that will take you back from the views to the <coughs> base rail var? Th those cases are certainly discussed in the book. What Next question, what feedback are you getting from large SQL vendors like Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, et cetera? Has no one expressed interest in developing a cleaner alternative to SQL? Well, oh, actually you've reminded me of something I should have said and forgot. Thank you. Um, I must tell you that um, the ideas I've been presenting are heavily based on work that I've done over the years with a colleague, David McGovern, and I've been heavily influenced by David's work in this. David actually has a patent. Uh, in the area of view updating. What he has in his pattern is not identical to what's in my book, but it's, um, if you like, in the spirit of it. He has certainly spent some time trying to persuade the vendors to um, implement something along the lines of what's in his pattern. He's gotten absolutely nowhere, I'm sorry to say. Um, people don't seem to think this is a very high priority question. Uh, second part of uh, Brian's question here, has no one expressed interest in developing a cleaner alternative to SQL? 
<laughs> that takes me back to the question I refused to answer a moment ago. Um, let me just say a little bit about background here. Um, along with another colleague, uh, Hugh Darwin, in the UK, I've been working for many years now on something we call the Third Manifesto. Uh, it's a silly title. I apologize for the title. It's kind of a political title. It's not important, the title. But anyway, what we propose, the Third Manifesto, we're trying to pr propose a direction for future database systems, future data management systems. And uh, in particular, we have proposed a much cleaner alternative to SQL. Now, talking to the mainstream vendors on this issue is extremely frustrating. They think all the time that they have much bigger fish to fry and they don't seem to be very interested. Although I think it's fair to say that in every one of the mainline vendors, there are little pockets of people in there saying, you know, we should really pay attention to what Hugh and Chris are doing with this third manifesto stuff. It looks good. Now, having said all that, there is at least one product out there that does abide by the prescriptions of the third manifesto. It's a small product from a small company. It's not even marketed as a DBMS. It's marketed as an application development engine. But the reason for that is, again, um, political or, or marketing. If they call themselves a DBMS, they'd be going head to head with Oracle and IBM, and they don't want to do that. What they have is something that does have a much cleaner uh, interface than SQL. And, uh, you know, Hugh and I have been lobbying on this one for a long time. Every time I have to do something in SQL, I get so frustrated. So <clears throat> let me go on. Another question. How would you perform updates which would lead to view migration except to the base rel var? Um, in that case, your application will not have the characteristic of logical data independence. I'm not sure I understand the follow on that, but updates that cause cause tuples to migrate from one view to another, we, we certainly handle that. Um, it's just a special case of the general scheme. So uh, yeah. I don't understand the follow-on part of that, but I'm, I'm claiming that what I am proposing gives you as much logical data independence as you can possibly get. So let me leave it at that. Uh, question. Uh, you've already introduced compensatory actions in your book, Database Explorations. Is there any new material ideas in this brand new book? Ah, yes. As a matter of fact, there is. In the book, Database Explorations, there's a chapter called How to Update Views, um, quite a long chapter. The book started off being an expansion of that chapter, but on the way, I realized that um, <clears throat> I got a few things wrong in the original chapter. Well, that's, that's the scientific method, isn't it? Um, yes, the... the What's in the book represents my most current, my most recent thinking, and it, and it supersedes anything previous that I have written on view updating. Another question. Um, will SQL syntax need to be updated to properly get view constraints? Actually, I don't think so. Um, funnily enough, um, constraints are one area where the SQL standard is better than the product. The SQL span is not too bad on constraints. It's just much more um, comprehensive than any of the mainstream products that I know about. Um, and as a matter of fact, in the standard, you can write constraints on views, although not very directly. You can write a create assertion statement where the, um, what, what the standard calls a search condition, the search condition can refer to views. So in effect, you can write view constraints it's just not very um, <clears throat> user-friendly, but it can be done. Uh, next question. How your approach manages to deal with updates in a general view setting. Oh, how does your approach manage to deal with updates in a general view setting, given that the current publications so far just deal with only restricted settings of views? Um, well, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. If it's saying that um, much of the initial and much of the existing literature talks about special cases and talks about how to update a join and how to update a restriction, how to update a projection, and so on, um, that's true. It does. And what I've tried to do is present a general mechanism where restrictions, projections, joins, and the rest are all special cases. 
it goes on, are there any assumptions you take into account? The only assumption, really, is that you're relational, um, which, of course, <laughs> rules out SQL somewhat. Um, but no, as long as you're abiding by uh, logic and set theory and the relational model, uh, that's all, I guess. Is that... Is it theoretically possible to express all constraints solely in terms of the expressions using tutorial D syntax? All constraints. Um, um, you can express all constraints that can be expressed in first order logic in tutorial D. Um, I think that's as much as I want to say on that one. Uh, Next, the pros of updatable views is quite clear, but what are, what are the cons? Will it lead to any I.O., memory, processor, overhead? Um, I'm not an implementer. Um, there's no free lunch, so there's going to be some costs somewhere. But I would imagine that the costs are trivial compared to the benefits. Um, but maybe I'm not the right person to answer that. Let me hurry on. The next one says, should we be distinguishing the problems into some subsets of usage? We talk as if as though there are some universal truths that will make all usage easier and more efficient, but shouldn't we divide the world? Well, I have a problem with that sort of philosophically. I don't think the, the vendors and so on will ever know all the problems that uh, users and customers are going to have. We should be providing general purpose solutions. The customers can do the special purpose, the, the, the special casing for their applications and so on. But, um, yeah, it's, it's like the business of types. You know, um, the vendors can never guess all the different types that users are going to want. So what they need to provide is not a whole bunch of system-defined types, but rather a user-defined typing mechanism. I see this as a similar sort of situation. Question, can you briefly explain how one would roll your own? Um, in the book, um, I am providing, in effect, the rules that I think apply to restrictions and projections and joins and all the rest. Um, and I would hope if the DBMS itself is not going to give you view update support. You could use triggers or stored procedures to do it for yourself. So as I mentioned briefly in the presentation, there might be some problems there if you can't do recursion. Because of course, you know, generally, um, a view defining expression might involve many different um, operations. It might be, for example, be a restriction of a projection. So first you have a, to apply the rules for projection, and then you apply the rules for restriction. That implies some kind of recursive implementation. And uh, I'm pretty sure that at least one of the vendors out there doesn't allow recursion and trigger, so that could be a problem. Um, apart from that, I don't think I have anything useful to say. Oh dear, what is your opinion of. I don't even know what Link is. <laughs> or Link Q, I don't know, know how you pronounce it. So I have no opinion on that one. Any thoughts on language integrated query? Oh, it's, um, it's the same thing, is it? Um, <laughs> my thoughts are I don't know anything about it. Sorry about that. Well, that seems to be the end of the questions. Uh, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much for listening. I hope I've given. I hope I've said enough to pique your interest. Um, and uh, I know this is a shame, shameless plug. But everything I've said today is in the book with a lot more explanation and a lot more consideration of all the special, the other cases too. And like I said, I'm open to constructive suggestions. So with that, I'll sign off. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Yasmina, for hosting. And uh, good luck with your database endeavors. Thank you. Chris, thank you so much for presenting the webcast today, for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. It's been a pleasure having you live in our studios. Folks that attended, thank you so much for attending. We hope you've benefited from the webcast. 
lots of good comments and chatter and questions in the group chat, so you folks are definitely paying attention. And with that, I also want to let you know Chris's book, View Updating and Relational Theory, is the O'Reilly deal of the day. And what that means for you is you can get it today at a really good price as a thank you for attending the webcast. I pushed out codes to you all and URLs in your group chat, so if you hadn't opened that group chat, please do valuable information there to save you some money. You can also visit O'Reilly.com. Look on the right-hand side. You can't miss it. It's right there. View updating and relational theory. And with a lot of your questions that came in, the book has a lot more detail in there, so it can really help you with your day-to-day. -day. Again, we thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast today. Goodbye, everybody.